Every night, just before I crawl into bed, I enjoy the treat of a small, red apple. I always end my day by eating the succulent fruit. My mother would always insist that I fill my stomach with a healthy snack before sleeping, and what better snack than a good old apple, she used to say. She was right. There is no better treat than the small red sphere of fructose and water. My bedtime ritual may sound strange, but I do believe it gives me a better sleep and I always awake feeling refreshed and nourished. I've not missed a day of eating an apple for as long as I can remember. Well, that is until a week ago. I felt a yawn build up in my throat and so I let it out with an exaggerated sound. It was getting late and I was getting tired, so I knew exactly what I needed to do. It was time to devour my apple and go to bed. I got up off the couch I had been sitting on for longer than I would like to admit and headed over to the kitchen. I walked past the large window that overlooks my fairly large backyard and towards the small wooden fruit bowl on my kitchen table. I looked down into it and expected to be greeted by a shiny red apple. But instead, I saw nothing but the bottom of the bowl. It was completely empty. I had completely forgotten to buy more apples that day, which would have been a better use of my time other than being parked on the lounge. This was the first time that this had happened to me. It would be the first time in my post-infant life that I had not eaten a piece of the fruit before going to sleep. I try not to worry about it too much, but deep down, I knew that my sleep would be restless and unfulfilling. I climbed into bed, my stomach rumbling slightly as I positioned myself underneath the sheets. I closed my eyes and tried to clear my mind and try to give myself the highest chance of going into a peaceful slumber. With my mind blank and seeing nothing but blackness, sleep was about to be upon me. Sleep was just about to extend its hand and pull me through to the world of unconsciousness. When I startled awake by a slight bumping sound, I jolted upwards in bed and listened for the noise again. Another bump sound echoed through my house. This time I heard it more clearly and realized that it emanated from my backyard. I kept listening, hoping that the noise would stop and I could just forget about it, but it persisted and I heard it for a third time. I couldn't ignore it any longer. I needed to know what it was that was causing this disturbance. I got out of my warm bed and hesitantly and anxiously made my way to the kitchen. My plan was to take a peek out of the window that stared directly into the backyard and then I would be able to see if anything was amiss. I quietly crept into the kitchen area, cautious of what could be causing the sound. I slowly tiptoed over to the large window and took a quick look out into the yard. Outside, it seemed mostly normal. The large grassed area was still intact, and the long line of trees that ran around the edge of the garden were still and unmoving. The small stone bird bath that stood in the center of the garden was also untouched. There was... There was one thing out of the ordinary in the backyard, though. Standing near the back of the lawn, there was a man. He was staring up towards the window. Towards me. His long, white lab coat swayed gently in the wind. Around his neck hung a stethoscope, and across his face sat a thick pair of black glasses. The man was clearly two things. He was definitely a doctor, and he was most definitely lost. When I first saw him, I was more worried for his personal safety than I was mine. I was perplexed as to why he was in my yard, but I was concerned that something bad might have happened to him that led him here. At that moment, I just wanted to help. Around his neck hung a stethoscope, and around his face sat a thick pair of black glasses. I left the kitchen and walked over to the back door that leads out to the yard. I opened it and took one lonesome step out into the garden. The doctor followed my every move with his eyes, but otherwise remained motionless. I looked at him for a moment, still trying to comprehend how and why he was standing on my back lawn. I called out to him just to confirm that he was indeed okay. Hey, excuse me, are, are you alright? I called out in the calmest voice that I could muster. Do you need any help? The doctor didn't break eye contact with me, not even to blink, but I still remained mute and frozen. 
I called out once more, and again asked him if he needed any aid. Once I had spoken to him for the second time, I saw a quick flutter of movement from the doctor. His right hand ever so slightly moved closer to the outside of his leg, slightly closer towards his pocket. The small hand movement made me nervous. Maybe because it was the first time I had seen him move, or maybe because he moved closer towards his concealed pocket which I couldn't see what it contained. I grew anxious, but still tried to remain calm and deduce what exactly was happening. I opened my mouth, readying my vocal cords to talk to the doctor again when I saw his hand quickly reach into his pocket. Before I could react, his hand re-emerged, but now it was holding a large syringe. The needle was long, and it glistened slightly in the moonlight. My brain quickly assessed the danger I was now in and wanted to turn and run, but my body wasn't quite that intuitive. My body stayed frozen for just a second too long. I was just about to run away when I heard a rustling sound at my side and then a white flash of movement. I quickly swiveled my head to see what it was that the corner of my eye had just detected. Coming forth from the trees that run along the edge of my garden, I saw another man come into view. He too wore a long, white lab coat and had a stethoscope dangling from his neck. The doctor had wild black hair that sprouted from his head. He was also brandishing something in his hand. It may have been a surgical scalpel, possibly another syringe. I'm not entirely sure because as soon as I saw him, I took off in the opposite direction. I turned to run back into the house, back to safety of four walls, but as I spun around and faced the door, I saw another doctor. This one was inside. He was standing just behind the back door, waiting for me to re-enter the house. I rapidly adjusted the direction I was heading in and ran along the side of the house and towards the small stone path that leads to the front yard and towards the street. I turned the corner at the edge of the house and began to sprint down the cobbled pathway. I was halfway along it when I saw a fourth doctor step out onto the path from beside the front of the house. In one hand, he held an apple. This doctor, also dressed the same as the others, took a step towards me tossing the apple into the air as he did. He caught the apple when gravity returned it to him, and then smiled at me. It was a cold smile, like he was enjoying giving a patient some bad news. I looked behind me for the means of escape, but saw that the other three doctors were closing in on me from that direction. I was surrounded and had no other option but to face the doctor holding the apple. I looked back towards him and watched as he inhaled sharply and took in a big sniff. He then started to speak, I've just tested your blood, and I'm sorry to tell you that it's not good news. I couldn't detect any scent of apple within your veins. And you know the saying, he said emotionlessly. I didn't respond, as I was too frightened and confused to react to what was happening. After pausing for a second and waiting for me to fill the silence, he realized that wasn't going to happen and so continued to speak. It's a bit late for this now. He said as he gestured towards the apple with his head, and one of these a day would have kept us away. As he finished talking, I heard a noise from behind me, and so turned my head around to see what it was. I immediately saw that it was the other three doctors advancing towards me. I instinctively moved forward to avoid them getting any closer, but in doing so, I moved closer to the fourth doctor. I was still looking behind me, and so didn't see that I had walked directly into him until I felt myself bump straight into his chest. I then felt cold hands wrap around my shoulders and a strong grip hold me so that I couldn't move. I spun my head back around and faced the doctor that now had me captured. I looked directly into his cold blue eyes and begged him to let me go. Please, I stammered. I, I don't understand wh wh what is happening. All four doctors began to laugh at the same time and I felt the presence of another three directly behind me. I, I, I didn't know what else to do, so, so I decided to fight. I had to fight. It was the only option left. I swiftly swiped my hand at the doctor who was holding me. My nails scratched across his pale cheek and I saw four deep gouges in his skin appear. Normally, the scratches would fill with red blood, but his didn't. The skin was wounded, but no liquid emerged from beneath his flesh. He looked down at me, no emotion on his face apart from maybe slight disappointment. I then felt something sharp enter my neck, and everything went black. I don't know how long I was unconscious for, but I awoke some time later and discovered myself in my bed. <laughs> my initial thought was that it had all been a dream. 
but then I felt something wrapped around my neck. I looked down and saw the stethoscope that was placed testing on my knee. I then noticed the white lab coat I was wearing. It was identical to the coats that my attackers were also wearing. I panicked as I was thoroughly confused by what I was seeing. Had they just played a cruel and dangerous prank on me? Had they scared me and then dressed me up as a doctor too? No. There had to be more to it than that. And there was. Those events all took place a week ago. And since then, I haven't been able to remove my lab coat and stethoscope. I mean, I physically would be able to take them off, but I don't want to. I can also smell other people. Not their perfume or deodorant, but their blood. More often than not, though, it is tainted with a repulsive smell of apple. When I smell someone's blood who is pure and not ruined by that stench, it makes me hungry. Maybe I crave it because I am missing my own. I cut myself shaving the day after I was attacked, and to my surprise, no blood seeped out of the wound. I then decided to prick my fingers with a sewing pin, and again, there was no blood. I think the doctors drank my clean blood, and it somehow transformed me into one of them. I have no other explanation as to what has happened to me, but I have a feeling that they will return to me. I think they will come back. And then, we can go and hunt. Good evening, everyone. Giggles the Croupier here. Just wanted to thank all of my incredible patrons for supporting me. Tam B, Jen Miser, Skymara Ravenswood, Melissa Perez, Bernard Jackson, Leaf Ninja, Roy Larimer, Mr. Creepypasta, Neon Scoundrel, and William Delphin. I'm still figuring out rewards for Patreon, but if you would still like to support, click the link in the description, and I will hopefully have something for you soon. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Mm-hmm. <laughs>